Uh, I had a sour laugh after I uh, closed up last week's session. I was actually within just a couple pages of finishing what I was reading to all of you, anybody who's present, and those few who insist on following me even when you're not present. So I could have easily finished without running much longer. So at any rate, I promise to finish today and I, I will start off today doing that. Over the following several weeks, oops, Gwen gushed forth with that which made her life more comprehensible. The next time the group met, she sighed and said that she wanted to talk some more about her stepfather. She then repeated how terrible were the scenes of brutality she witnessed being inflicted on her mother. Once she ran to get a knife and threatened to use it if he did not leave her mother alone. I came thus to appreciate the toxic interject she had incorporated into her own being from these bruising encounters. Now suddenly, however, her tale shifted. She began describing her stepfather coming into her room one night. Gwen stopped, flushed, went incredibly tense and would not go on. I asked her what she was happening and she screamed, I can't bear him. I assumed she was talking about her stepfather. I urged her to say what she wanted to say to him. My instructions to her to enter into a dialogue with the half fantasy, half remembered shade of that man on that nameless occasion and what it had precipitated, put her into a trance-like state. Gwen became 14 again. <clears throat> she relived and reproduced what I knew was in store for all of us. Her stepfather's feared, longed for, luscious, tormenting, lacerating, hungering attempt at rape for that night, that awful night of her memory. Who knows whether the events were real or not? I still do not know, but the reality was powerful that evening when she described them to us. It gushed forth from her in great anguish, screams and sobs. All of us ceased to exist for her as she contended once more with her forbidden lover opponent. When she had finished, she lapsed into almost soundless, battered whimperings. Her tear-drowned eyes remained closed. I picked her up and rocked her as if I would my own daughter. At first she drank me in, then I felt her stiffen. I knew intuitively what was happening and I said to Gwen, no, I don't have an erection. She realized it too at the same time and turned to rub once more in my lap. Yet at that moment, I sensed our relationship was doomed and hopeless. If I held her at some emotional distance to placate her longing, terrified struggle over being penetrated, she would rail at me for being no help, disinterested or worthless to her. If she captured my attention and I started to move closer to her, I would become the bearded satyr, too exciting, too forbidden, and too dangerous to deal with. Either way, the end result was an outburst of fearful hatred. I talked to her often about this frustrated, impotent dilemma into which she trusts me. It never did any good. Instead, Gwen, Gwen began to separate from me. She started to come to group less and less. At first, I felt comfortable with this, for the events of her life demonstrated a thrust toward increasing competency and mastery. She received a significant promotion at work. She separated from her boyfriend lover and began boyhood lover and began to explore the possibilities of loving a much more capable man a few years older than was she. In spite of the growing separation between us, I first began to appreciate that she and I were still in some kind of chaotic trouble together when she executed a tremendously devious manipulation on me. One day she called me to ask me for a referral. A friend who I did not have, a friend who did not have much money wanted to enter therapy and asked her, so she said, for the name of a good clinic. I provided this to her. And I added that the friend should ask for Dr. X, if possible, at that agency, where I knew he had a good reputation. 
Three months later, I found out when Gwen began to talk matter of factly about it in a group that it was Gwen herself who had gone to see Dr. X and that Dr. X had begun seeing her, not at the clinic, but in his private practice. I went on seeing Gwen on her occasional visits to group until a little over three years ago. Then her world fell apart. She finally mustered the courage to tell her new lover that she was falling in love with him and to ask him for more of himself than he had been willing to give to her thus far. He smiled, told her that she was a very sweet thing, but that all he wanted her for was an occasional night in the sack. He laughed delightedly at her precious gift of her vowing that she took to the refrigerator to break out a bottle of champagne. Gwen went berserk, tore up the man's apartment, and forced him to throw her out bodily. She then came to group the next week, started up her screaming machine again, complained that I was an evil monster who ruined people's lives, and stormed out of the office. I did not see Gwen again for three months. I was relieved. I thought she was gone forever and I was happy. I had at last left my previous life, was living alone and fell joyously in love with the woman who is now my wife. Gwen's seeming departure was a mystical sign to me that my perilous journey was at last over and that I was able to rest in my wife's arms, exhausted, ecstatic, and optimistic about what we were beginning to build. Much to my surprise, Gwen signed up for a weekend marathon I held the next January. My soon-to-be wife accompanied me on that occasion. As I relive these moments, I remember how Gwen stared at the two of us in hateful envy. She detested my happiness. She tried to interfere with sarcasm and cruel mockery, any work I attempted to do. I finally stopped everything to contend with her. I was quaking with tension. After Gwen played many screaming broken records over and over again, I asked her what the hell she wanted from me. To my astonishment, she softened and asked me to hold her. Haltingly, I agreed. She came and sat next to me. I put my arm around her and she leaned against me, but I felt some kind of stiffness and unyieldingness in her manner and her bearing. I told her I missed the vulnerable child she had on a precious very few occasions allowed herself to be with me. My wife in her usual marvelously intuitive fashion saw the look on Gwen's, uh, in Gwen's eyes and began to speak of her, of her own struggles with pride and envy. They swapped tales of being children of longing for good fathers and of the turmoil and fear that such longings create. My wife urged that Gwen be resolute in searching for that which she wanted and that she not allow her fears of other women's retribution to turn her aside from her quest. Gwen softened and allowed herself at last to surrender to being held. Later in the night, one of the women in the group asked Gwen for permission to, and indeed, feed her from a baby's bottle. Gwen then disappeared from my life. Once in a while, I would get a phone call from her complaining bitterly about the cold, cruel, and vicious treatment she was receiving at the hands of Dr. X. I urged her each time to discuss her grievances, real or imagined with him, and told her that she was always welcome as she was to return to group. The many people missed her and asked about her. Last June, I got a call from her again. She and Dr. X had gotten into a fight and he had thrown her out of therapy, saying that he was sick of her vicious bitchiness, would not put up with it anymore and was not going to see her again. Gwen sounded crazy and frightened on the phone. I began to get anxious. Two weeks later, I came into my office and found it in shambles. All my books had been thrown on the floor. The furniture was overturned. The one with Jesus Christ Superstar. And, oh, Time Magazine. A cover from Time Magazine, the one that Jesus Christ Superstar was on, had been ripped off. A knife thrust through the face of Jesus and paled it to my couch. I knew immediately who had done it, and I began to fear for my life. Then Gwen called and asked for an individual appointment. I refused, telling her that I was afraid of the violence in her. 
I urged her to come to group so that we could talk where we would both be safe. She screamed at me and hung up. On Monday night at 10 p.m. last June, I left group and went to the basement of my building to get my car. Gwen jumped me, shrieking murderously from the shadows of my car. In fear and fury, I protected myself and I decked her. She went down hard and lay still moaning in pain. I broke my finger in the process. She mumbled that her back was hurt. I ran to fetch aid. When I returned, she was gone. Three weeks later, a fireman came into my office. Gwen had been gathered in off the roof of my building after having threatened noisily for an hour to jump. She was on the way to the receiving hospital. The physician in charge called me. He said Gwen had confessed to him that it was the third attempt she had made on her life in 48 hours. Not only were her wrists lashed, but her body was battered from having driven her car into a bridge abutment as well. I called Gwen's mother and urged her to have Gwen detained. The mother reported that Gwen had assaulted her parents and her father's psychiatrist during the past week. I begged the mother to have Gwen hospitalized. Instead, the mother screamed at me for being one of the fucking Jew doctors that had ruined her daughter's life. Screaming in fury, she told me she was gonna take Gwen home. For the next three weeks, I walked in dread, not knowing whether Gwen was alive or dead, not knowing if she would come at me out of some other dark night, this time with a weapon. Late in July, Gwen called again. She asked for an appointment. For some reason known only to my sense of uncanny, I granted her request. I was terrified, but I needed to confront some primitive dread in me. I was sick to death of being a person who always ducked bullies and fled from the possibilities of violence. She would be the occasion for me to confront me. I got to the office early. Gwen was due at 8 a.m. and removed everything breakable or throwable. She appeared. We glared at each other. She berated me for not coming to rescue her from her suicide attempts. I told her I too was not willing to contend with her murderousness. She began to weep. She related to me that she had made appointments with eight different therapists in the past four weeks and had physically assaulted all eight of them and had fled. I cursed her for having broken my finger. She then launched into a vicious tirade against Dr. X that occupied most of the balance of our time. When her fury was spent, she sighed and said, I guess I'll live, but I don't think I'm going to go on with therapy. When our session was over, Gwen suddenly lunged at me. I stiffened in terror and what was on the verge of screaming, but all she did was plant a child's kiss on my cheek. As she disappeared down the hall, she smiled bravely and called out over her shoulder. You're the only one who always lets me come back. I have not seen or heard from her the, this past three years. And as a side, I never saw or heard from her again. Psychotherapy is an incredible, always incomplete journey. I could analyze the vicissitudes of the transference and countertransference struggles in this case, and or describe how our mutual dynamics led us to bruise each other. I shall, however, refrain. I believe with Kierkegaard that, quote, to analyze an experience is to destroy it, close quotes. I choose then to be simply a narrator a philosopher, a novelist of human lives, a poet, a reporter on the terribleness of my conduct and on the terribleness of the conduct with whom my terribleness was being inflicted. In the long run, it is the experiences we inflict on each other that mold and reshape us. Gwen served me well as my vicious companion at a time I needed to be persecuted. The impress of her being will always be with me. Okay, you want to unmute yourselves for a couple minutes to see if has anybody to say about this because it's come to closure now. Arthur, do you ever wonder what happened to her or even to this day? Yes, of course. Not often. Yeah. As a matter of fact, only when I remembered that I probably should share this as a wonderful example of my craziness and my limitations as a human being. 
did I even think of her again? I think it's probably been decades since I've thought of her. Yeah. Since she stopped trying to interact with me, she disappeared out of my consciousness. I remembered her to this extent. It's always been part of my memory when I think about writing or things that I've written to remember that I wrote this and it was published in this book. But the actual content of what went on, I, I have been cringing reading it to you now. Uh, the, that, that detail of the actual transactions between us just fills me with shame and embarrassment. And, and, uh, when I should have been turning right, I turned left. And I did that unerringly over and over again. And I, it's nothing to be proud of at all. Well, I mean, the pride, it's at least well, maybe pride, but you had a stick to itness that I know I wouldn't have had. The willing to like engage with someone who becomes that, you know, essentially dangerous, you know, that, that you know. I, I don't think any, probably almost anybody listening to this has ever had someone put a knife through their couch or been assault, you know, jumped in the bed in the, in the parking structure. You know, I know it happens, but it's not very often and not often several times by the same client. Did you ever think about kind of like what was defining about your interaction with her as opposed to some of the other therapists that you had, Arthur? I don't know too much, except, except for Dr. X, when she was pouring out her guts about how she hated him. I don't know too much about the, any other therapist she tried to interact with. She was very secretive about many things. And she would tell me she isn't going to talk about that. She would tell it with a great certainty. And I knew it would be futile to try and encourage her to, because she would just start screaming. She needed to be in control of whatever the interactions between us were. And I saw no way I could take that control away from her. I felt like I was riding crazy waves in the ocean some of the time. I just needed to ride them. Making comments as they occurred to me, and most of the comments I made to her were uh, from the era of an era in our culture and in our field. It should all hang up. The solution to effective living was that everybody should just interact with each other authentically. That meant withhold nothing, sharing all raw feelings and all crazy thoughts with each other. And that that, that was the, the trail to nirvana. And I was going to do that as her therapist. So I'm so embarrassed by things I said to her. Yeah. How would you do it if you had to do it all over again with her? Make a referral to you. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I'm not available. <laughs> I, I think I would, uh, I would use what they call in cognitive behavioral therapy, radical self-disclosure. If she started, well, I always felt like I was being trapped. If, if I got too interested in her, or too kind, I was about to become the rapist, the seducer, and she would rage at me and drive me away. And if I became too aloof, then she would rage at me about that. I didn't care about her and I was no good and I was worthless. And so there was some strange middle line I had to steer in order to keep her interacting with me without going off some deep end. I probably would have talked about that. I, I probably would have said, I, I don't want to be too responsive to what you're telling me about because it seems to me you can feel that as being very dangerous if I start getting too involved with you. On the other hand, if I move too far away and I'm quiet when you want my participation, feels like there's some kind of wound about being abandoned and I'm going to rub that wound. So frankly, frankly, I feel tied up in knots. I don't know what to do at this moment. That's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a double bind uh, parallel process. Yes. We were both in this, this, this kind of double bind where neither anything either of you would do would seem to work, would yes. always trigger something. Yeah. You were feeling what she was going through. Yes. <laughs> I have a sense of absurd. I, I might have asked her, <laughs> I would have at least had the daydream of asking her, look, 
I'm having a really hard week. Would you just be quiet? Could I talk to you about what I'm struggling with this week? And you can listen and try and see if you can help me at all. I would certainly be tempted to pull that stick on her. I don't know if I would actually do it. I use that as an opening line, usually with couples. Enough about you guys. What about me for a change? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you ever Thank see you. some? Do you ever see someone similar to her again, Arthur? Yeah, I think on another occasion I talked about the client I was really frightened of who was threatening to kill me. Hmm. Oh God, those are the only two who were really very painful and upsetting to see. Most of the time, being in our career is quite a pleasant occupation. Yeah. All right, I'm ready to get on to the next thing. You ready for me to get on yeah. to the next thing? Sure. I yeah. am really excited. Hmm. A dilemma that's bothered me for years, I found a resolution to in the middle of the night. You know me, I think I've said on occasions here that I have six books that are partly written and I can't find the time to finish any of them. And th then I have doubts because I'm not sure who the audience is. I'm talking in 17 voices. I, sometimes I think I'm writing textbooks for graduate students and that's the content of what I'm writing about. Sometimes I think it's a book for the lay public and that's what I'm writing about. And then sometimes I think it, it's a book for the profession and I'm writing a professional book of some kind uh, to start a movement or something. And, so I, I, my voice keeps changing in all of these books from talking to one audience to another. Then I know the publication business has now gotten foul over the years of my life. And unless you have 100,000 followers on social media, the book publishers are not inclined to <laughs> publish your books for you because they want to be sure there's a big audience out there for them before they, they take the publishing risk. I don't feel like self-publishing. I don't feel like wasting $25,000 or so trying to get a publish a book myself have copies of it and have Amazon sell it for me I that doesn't seem like it would go anywhere whatsoever so I have been absolutely stymied about what is the book I'm going to write and how am I going to write a book I solved the time problem what triggered me was the presentation I made a few weeks ago about mouthing off to my friend about taking him to task for being duplicitous because he said all he wanted to do was get married, but he found the flaw in everybody he went out with for periods of time. And they were, there were reasons that he had discovered that they weren't the right one. And he, he would cry in his bitter disappointment that he thought that he was moving to the destination and wasn't getting there. Uh, so in in the second part of the book, when I'm commenting on my work with him, I did make some general comments about marriage. And then I, I laid out 12 different things, 12 different challenges that married couples have to accomplish in, in order to put together a sustaining and enduring good working alliance with a partner. And as I got through that, the reading of that, that night I was up in the middle of the night and I said, that's an outline for a book. Why don't you write a book about marriage? That's a very popular topic. You know a lot about it. You struggle with many couples and you even have an outline. You, you laid out 12 things that uh, the, the people who want a vibrant marriage need to address and resolve in, in many hours of conversation with each other. Those are the 12 chapters of the book. You can, you can use the story of your friend as a kind of introductory piece that leads into how complicated marriages are. And the first principle is you have to be emotionally ready to be married and not stuck in some kind of adolescent fantasy that you're living out over and over again. That's the first chapter. So you can use your work with him as the illustration of the first chapter. And you don't have to write the book. You're giving a lecture each week. So each week you can lecture on the contents of one of the chapters and it won't be as articulate as if you sat, sat down and wrote it, but you'll have the raw material there. 
you can get that transcribed and you can edit what you've muttered about. And one by one, week after week, you will be generating another chapter of your book and without doing much else other than some, some rearranging, some editing or a little bit of addition or subtraction to what your spoken words were. So that's what I'm going to do. I have a project and I believe I will at last complete a book about something. And it's going to be a book about marriage. So bravo, <laughs> bravo. All right. Okay. <laughs> you guys are going to be my audience. You're going, to, you're going to hear the verbal first draft of the book. Great. I thought in order to get started, though, I would write some stuff. And I, I put in a couple hours writing some stuff at the beginning of the book to give myself a running start. So here it is. The working title is Creating and Maintaining an Enduring Marriage. All right. Good, good start. Good start. <laughs> That's the Pre easy part. <laughs> Preface. I turned 90 years of age this past year, and I am heading for my 91st birthday. At last counting, for 64 of those years now, I have followed a career I love. I am a psychologist, and I have thereby been privileged to hear a multitude of accounts of yearning of hurt, and sometimes of wonderful achievements and improvements shared with me by the over 3,000 clients who by now have brought tales from their lives with them into my consulting room. My work is fascinating and compelling. It forces me to be a learner as much as it forces my clients to be learning what they need to learn. So I have no desire ever to retire. As long as I am able, I will continue to welcome families, couples, children, adolescents, young adults, middle-aged persons, the elderly and the dying into my presence and into what always becomes a shared conversation in which together we search for the secrets of effective living. I am also privileged to have been the founding campus dean of a fine school of professional psychology one that educates and trains those who desire to secure the preparation needed to become practicing members of my field. In addition to administrative duties and my 45 years of service to the institution, I frequently taught many of the courses in the curriculum and also found myself charged with responsibilities for supervising the counseling work of many students who were learning as a part of their training how to interact with actual clients assigned to them. At the present time then, over 1,200 psychologists who for periods where my students or my supervisees are presently working in their own careers in most of the states of this nation and even in several foreign countries. My life as I lived it, I am proud to relate, has compelled me to come to know useful perspectives, ones either learned or discovered. I am referring here to perspectives that have come to provide me the basis for my being able to undertake helpful conversations with clients and with students. But of all the topics in my field about which I have accrued some wisdom, the one to which I am powerfully drawn back over and over again is the topic of marriage. I don't think that needs to be much of a surprise to those joining me on this journey. We psychologists tend to be strongly fascinated by personal struggles in which we ourselves have been enmeshed. And I am no exception to this important truth. Gratefully, I am still steeped in the second of what has been my two marriages. The first was embraced when I was only 21. That marriage turned out to be an immersion in a torrent of extremely painful, hurtful, distressing, and disappointing life experiences. It took me 15 years to find the courage to pack a bag and to leave a wife, and by then two small children. It took two more years to find my way through and out of a very toxic divorcing process in order to secure the final dissolution document. Then everything turned. I met and started to build a new relationship with a possible better partner, a woman named Hermine. 
It seemed to me when I met her as if her very name was an important message from the universe. A character named Hermine is the heroine of one of my very favorite novels, Hermann Hesse's Steppenwolf. The entry of Hesse's Hermine into his suffering protagonist's life and the experiences in the magic theater that she provided to him led him out of his angry hermit-like despair and into a life of light and human connectedness. Upon meeting, I immediately hoped that my Hermine could do the same for me. And this time, my hopes were realized. Proceeding to build the union between my Hermine and myself, though, proved to be full of intricate, sometimes arduous challenges. It was the other arena in which I was learning what was really important. Marriage to Hermine was not only an endeavor that required creative work and the kind and thoughtful involvement of we two adults, as I noted above, I had two children from my broken marriage who needed to be included in the union we were struggling to create. Hermine was bringing her own two little girls too. She also had been recently divorced. And, and as our partnership deepened, we had to navigate our way through the extra challenge of creating a working step family, one that took care of the needs not only of two adults, but of four children as well. At the same time, we had to try to overcome the pulls, challenges, and poisonous disruptions being inflicted on us by our prior spouses who were making dissonance and trouble for our enterprise long after the final papers had been issued. It was quite a learning experience back at the beginning of our union, and Hermine and I are still learning how best to manage and to nourish our very special an always evolving partnership after 50 years of being together. The search for wisdom never ends. In addition to my painfully lived experience, I have learned so much about the challenges of marriage through other engagements. One of my earliest periods of service while still in graduate school was a year's internship at the Merrill Palmer School in Detroit, Michigan. That setting was both an educational training institute for teachers, social workers, and psychologists, but in addition, a laboratory school, school for children with special learning needs, both the brilliant ones and the damaged ones. In addition, it provided adjunctive mental health services to the children, to the parents, or to the whole family if such services were deemed to be desirable. My internship was the first time I, I was charged by a setting with a responsibility for trying to help couples learn to navigate the challenges of managing intimate partnerships well. After receiving my degree in 1958 and returning to Southern California, I joined a group practice with other psychologists. From the beginning of what was now to be my career, some portion of the person seeking services with me as a staff member in the group was a cohort of troubled adults seeking services focused on marital or family relationship issues. And it was a fortunate time for me to be honing my skills and also growing new ones for doing so. In addition to a plethora of self-help books, that decade of my beginning my career and the ones immediately following beyond suddenly were full of exploding professional journal articles and book pages devoted to the challenges of understanding the paradoxes of marriage and of family life, the sources of disruption that interfered with reasonable conduct as a partner in a marriage or as a child or parent in a family, and those of us who charged with helping uh, the hurting could find useful aid in what was being published. Over the years of stretching my own competencies at being a husband in a long-term marriage, welcoming many, many troubled clients to my consulting room so I could review and help with nodes of trouble in their marriages, and teaching many courses to students on family and couples therapy, I have been both a participant and a learner. And now my growing competency and mastery of understanding and working through the challenges of marriage suggested to me that I should record the elements of what I have been learning in a book. At my age, I know I do not have that long to continue living. 
This topic, I believe, would best serve my wish for an immortality project, something that might be noticed and valued by some even after I am no longer alive. Some beginning considerations. It would certainly come as no surprise if I write that much of the time I have spent in my office over all the years I've been in practice has been spent with clients hurting as a result of some painful turbulence flowing from the nature of their relationships or non-relationships with other humans. Some are wallowing in pretense, telling me they yearn for human warmth when they really are quite avoidant and afraid to be vulnerable to anyone. Many are lonely because they have not managed to secure a sufficiency of human warmth in their existence. Some have been badly wounded along the path of life and find it hard not to keep revisiting and brooding about the scenes trapped in present poisonous relationships and have neither the skill nor the will uh, to be able to transform or to leave those relationships. Some are following the cultural project of, quote, looking for a life partner, close quotes, or at least as you shall soon see, they are insisting to themselves that such is the case, and then are feeling distressed because, quote, they cannot find the right one, close quotes. And some fail over and over again to maintain effective and sustaining human connections because they are clueless about how to manage the creation of what is possible with anyone who shows up in their lives and might in fact be a reasonable person with whom to spend ongoing special time. There are varieties of different factors that can create relationship incompetency, emptiness, or turbulence, but that's a whole other book entirely. I shall only observe here that when I was in graduate school, I started with great personal urgency to reflect about the search for what is required to sustain supportive intimacy. I became preoccupied with the issue because my own early marriage was becoming increasingly painful even unbearable, and of course, because some of the coursework to which I was being exposed had contents that were providing me with much food of thought about my own circumstances. For example, I remember being in an introduction to clinical psychology class with E. Lowell Kelly, one of the founders of my profession and a giant in the field I wanted to enter. In an idle moment and related to no particular topic of his lecture that I can remember, Professor, Professor Kelly made a whimsical aside in his remarks to us, an aside whose words have stuck, stuck with me over more than 60 years. Well, in essence, we humans are social animals, pack animals, and by nature, we are bent towards the need for warmth and connectedness to others. So it's quite simple. There are two kinds of human beings. There are those for whom the longing for love is enormous. It is so great that those so endowed will walk on hot, hot coals, run any risk, try to obtain love over and over again, even though they may have had to put up with endless hours of hurts and disappointments. Even if bloody, they will persist. If in the end they believe there might be even a shred of possibility that their efforts could secure love. Then there are the others, those among whom disappointments and hurts have crushed any such hope. All they want is to be cautious, to remain safe, to make sure they can minimize any suffering that might be inflicted on them at the hands of others. The latter sequester themselves, keep their relationships superficial, and try as much as they can to create hermit-like existences." Close quotes. Early in my practice, though, I came to the conclusion that Professor Kelly was partly onto something, but was also oversimplifying an important factor of human life that was much more complex than his, quote, two kinds of people, unquote, metaphor. Yes, we are indeed social beings and must have human interaction to sustain us. The good feeling that comes from being cherished is as important to the nourishment of our souls as food is to the nourishment of our bodies. But at birth, we enter the world in a state of exceptional helplessness and vulnerability. And then for many years, longer than any other living organism, we are dependent upon and hypersensitive 
to both administrations and blunders of others who care for us. A certain quantum of good parenting is critical for unfolding development and for our ability to reach independence with the capacity to regulate one's own life reasonably well. Most of us are fortunate enough to receive at least the minimum care necessary for us to complete the task of growing up. But no one has perfect parents. No one makes the journey from birth to autonomy without some wounding. We are all subjected to some episodes of neglect, cruelty, incompetence of parenting, misunderstandings, lack of empathy, exploitation, seductions, cruel or foolish punishment, demands to learn principles for living that are ill-considered or lead to self-handicapping, rigid scripting of what we are to become. And these are only, only some examples of harmless interactions, harmful interactions between parents and children. But, we're, but we are also the recipient of nurturance, soothing, kindness, caring, compassion, protection, support, wisdom, and validation of our right to be ourselves as well. For too many humans though, their primary and ongoing early experiences are mainly drawn from my former, the dark group. For those more fortunate, their primary stream of experiencing is composed mostly of the kinds of experiences with others that foster sturdy development. So we adults, contrary to Professor Kelly's simplistic duality, actually can be placed on a continuum. I would certainly agree that all of us do hunger for human belonging and warmth, and all of us are ambivalent about it, and at the same time fear the array of unpleasant or even terrible consequences that can be inflicted on us when we live out a vulnerable willingness to build close attachments. At one extreme side of the spectrum then, are those Kelly said will run great risks and do almost anything if they believe love might result. As the French symbolist poet Arthur Rimbaud noted in the 1800s, when I die, I would like to have made my body so marked by the scars of trying to love as to make an autopsy impossible. And at the other extreme of the spectrum are those among us so wounded by having been traumatized during their early years of preparation for life, that they are willing as adults to embrace loneliness, if they can thereby avoid closeness successfully and keep around them walls, <coughs> excuse me, of keep around them walls of protection from others. But most of us take up some position closer to the midpoint of the continuum, a position that expresses for each of us at least a partial desire to be open, to embrace and to bond with others, but mixed in are episodes of intermittent withdrawal from others and are engaging instead of various kinds of self-protective maneuvers designed to keep distance and minimize vulnerability, even if we let somebody keep us company part of the time by our side as we walk the path of our lives. During the early years of my career, I also began to learn that for those of us who live in this nation, the challenges of creating and supporting intimate closeness with others is complicated because we are raised, immersed in certain cultural teachings that fill us with myths that are bound to confuse us. The Greeks have three terms for different kinds of human warmth, eros for the yearning for sexual union, philia for an appreciation of and respect for the personhood of the other and the wonderful benefits that flow to both persons by their mutual participation in a relationship. And agape, a caring that arises based upon the commitment of a selfless decision. It entails the altruistic choice to seek someone else's well being proactively, even if there are uncertain or unknown prospects of reciprocation or benefit. Unfortunately, in our culture, we are not practiced in identifying our thoughts and feelings in such ways. We conflate what the Greeks clearly saw as separate and other important forms of caring and responsiveness as well into a single word, love. 
and thereby confuse ourselves and others with whom we interact. I will address this more fully below. But we have not only lost the wisdom of the Greeks, an array of beliefs about relationships that we absorb in our modern culture creates real difficulties for all of us in building, under, building understanding, and managing human connections. First, our dominant culture still teaches that for those reaching adulthood, one of the most important exemplars defining having achieved a proper maturity is the willingness and a readiness to enter into the institution of marriage. Even we have arrived at a time when even those with alternative forms of sexuality also uphold and want the privilege of marriage. All who grow up are indeed expected to embrace marriage, and those who do not do so are stigmatized and treated as if their behavior of remaining single is a sign of serious mental aberration, of secret sexual deviancy, or at minimum, at least represents a kind of stunted, aberrant development or eccentricity that ought to be overcome. The continuing belief about, quote, the importance of getting married, close quotes, is a good example of the phenomenon that the cultural anthropologists refer to as cultural lag. Often behaviors that are changing and how a particular culture is organized is not recognized by its members for quite a long time. Anthropologists have long noted that in times of more rapid cultural change, it often takes the passing of three or four generations before the consciousness of the culture's members and the values they embrace come to catch up with and come into congruous with how existence is actually being structured as the lives of the members of the culture evolves. So let me take note of what are the statistics in this nation. We are so busy worrying about what ought to be that we have failed to look at what is. So here's what is. At this point in time, more adult Americans are living unpaired than are engaged in a willingness to join with a significant other. Just as birth rates are also declining, so the general willingness among the populace to build a lifelong partnership with fellow humans has just kept declining year by year for quite a long time now. Yet most of us ignore this very significant cultural change and we behave as if we were continuing to expect marriage from the members of each oncoming generation. We are dismayed, almost scolding when individuals, with individuals who do not marry. Given how we are continuing to stigmatize single life for those of marrying age here in the 21st century, it would still take a lot of courage and a great deal of integrity from any of us to announce something like, quote, I'm not interested in marrying. The institution doesn't suit me. I'll have friends to spend time with me when I want some company. I can and will have some with whom I can express my intermittent yearning for some sexual companionship other than with my own hand. But I always want to occupy my own residence, my own space, my own solitude, and I don't want to be frequently burdened with the needs, the responsiveness, the commentary, and the lamentations of another human being almost most of my time." Close quotes. I also have had a chance to reflect a great deal about how terribly we have conflated so much into one word, love. In our culture, we have been and are continuing to create generations, particularly of men, who find it overwhelmingly difficult to just utter the words, I love you. The announcement has come to mean, if I say I love you, it means I am going to marry you. And so marrying, I'm also making a lifelong commitment to remain your partner. In addition, I'm going to be faithful to you and forever love and forswear forever loving anyone else for the rest of my life, except perhaps children we may have. And so many men dread saying, I love you, because each feels that unless he is ready enthusiastically to embrace all parts of these avowals, he cannot properly and fully speak of love. 
And given ongoing trends in our culture, I worry that in another five few years, it may become just as hard for similar reasons for women to say the same word. But the elements we erroneously merge together as love are totally separable. One can love and not marry. One can marry and not love. One can marry love and not enact fidelity. The high divorce rate in this country reveals too that only a minority of marriages last for the span of a lifetime. So there is no forever. In addition to these complexities, I believe we ought to do even better than did the Greeks and to create a vocabulary in English that more aptly captures the complexities of the array of possible bonds that grow between humans as we create them in the modern era. Even the English translation of the three different words or concepts the Greek use are insufficient to capture the actual nature of possible connections between two people as we are currently constructing these connections. Here are the most problematic to label the nature of two forms of human relatedness for which I think we ought to be careful and pick special words. Falling in love, the beginning stages of what is love is called falling in love. Or sometimes it's described as becoming smitten. These terms refer to the sudden glorious and joyous rush of anticipation on meeting and beginning interest in a certain stranger whose appearance and manner on the first encounter stir a racing heart, sweaty palms, yearning in the loins, great approach avoidance, ambivalence, and a sense that one may be in the presence of, quote, the one, close quotes, who is waiting to embrace us perfectly. Falling in love it is such a wonderful human experience. Everyone should have at least 17 such infatuations over a lifetime. When in the grip of the state, life seems radiant and joyous and not absolutely perfect, yet for reasons I am about to specify, I prefer that we call this state infatuation and not love. Or sometimes I even use the word employed by various sociologists, limerence. The state of infatuation is always based on unreality. The person being seen by the infatuated observer is in the greatest part as yet unknown to the observer. During that some enchanted evening when you meet a stranger, to borrow a line from the song from South Pacific, we are only aware at first of certain surface properties easily observed, appearance, carriage, sounds of voice, movement, vocabulary, style of dress, matters that could be readily apprehended in the early few minutes of any new encounter. With continuing experience of the otherness of the other, however, infatuation is always doomed we begin to see what we had not glimpsed at first, disappointing features, irritating features, even dismaying ones. And then conflicts and misunderstandings also begin. If we are unlucky, in fact, the bubble of infatuation is popped as soon as the other we have met begins to speak. If we are more fortunate, the divine madness can last some days or weeks. The record among clients I have seen has actually been about three and a half years, but infatuation always ends and it can never be the basis on which some more enduring union might be established. Love proper is my term. As the pair meets and one another or both of them then begins to experience the decay and disruption of infatuation, a choice between them, <laughs> excuse me, a choice between them to move apart from each other, the most common practice, or to begin to undertake serious work to create a union based on what I'm going to specify is the correct reference for the word of love. Achieving love is not a beginning. It is a destination at which some can arrive, but only after coming great challenges. The enterprise is a difficult one. The work requires transparency, vulnerability, and a tolerance for finding pathways through frustration and for managing differences. Few do it well. 
The decision not to move apart as the wreckage of infatuation becomes apparent. The decision to make the attempt to achieve love may well have to start with what is a fairly a simple assessment. It goes something like this. On the balance being with, name a possible partner, is good in many ways. But he, she is deficient in name of various characteristics excessive about name of other characteristics and maddening about name of still other characteristics yet she he does provide me with 60 to 70 percent of what would be a good partner to have by my side as i move through life on the balance is my life better because he she exists and we're able to be together than i am when i'm without here her or him Am I willing to discuss everything frankly and begin to make the attempt to see whether name a possible partner is flexible? I'll have to reveal my pettiness and my own limitations if we pursue such a conversation. Maybe I owe it to both of us to make serious attempts to overcome what divides us, not knowing whether I'll succeed or not. I don't know how flexible he or she is. I don't know how much he or she is either willing or able to modify what I'd like to be different. And part of the reason I'm in this dilemma now is that I've become aware of some wounds he or she brings to our interactions. Am I willing to try to be created and to help heal his or her wounds? Could I make a difference? And am I willing to put my life on the line to be courageous, expose all of my concerns, talk about anything and everything, and strive for all I am trying to reach without knowing what the outcome of my attempts might be. Maybe I could begin the process, enter into it with courage, creativity, and good faith, test what's possible, and get some sense of whether or not myself and the other could indeed begin to build something solid and more sustaining between us. If the answer to this long question of whether to part or whether to risk proceeding to test and to build is yes, that an enormous amount of interpersonal work has to begin. The nature of that work will constitute the chapters in this book. But here's my list of 11 of the human dilemmas that will have to be addressed and at least partially resolved between the two before any partnership might begin to be well constructed. And I assume, the and I assure you, the list is not exhaustive. Having successfully navigated fairly well through adolescence, becoming a well-functioning adult who has arrived at a psychological readiness for domesticity, having learned how to address conflict with others and to resolve those th conflicts thoughtfully and respectfully, having discovered ways to tolerate and maybe even to honor differences in values and beliefs in another. Understanding personal tactics for bringing inevitable disparities in universal needs into some mutual tolerable conformity. The needs are balancing productivity, intimacy, erotic union, and taking solitude alongside a partner for whom the preferred balance in these four things will always be devilishly otherwise than mine. Having a willingness to reveal everything and to hold back none of the contents of one streams of consciousness in the interactions with the other. Being in possession of working rituals for decision-making, which one of the pair gets to make the determinative decision about what kinds of disputed contents when the partner when the parties to the partnership cannot come to consensus learning how to create non-exploitative distributions of responsibilities for all the various support activities that must be done to make lives possible knowing how to exist in reasonable harmony about and to be responsible for caretaking a shared space common space being willing to develop a plan for jointly coping with and structuring the nature of relationship with many others, with relatives, friends, colleagues, and eventually children who may or may not be created. 
creatively fashioning rituals for the use of precious leisure time. Finally, being willing to meld finances and agreeing to honor the terms of a shared budget. Unfortunately, those who do seek a sustaining partnership have had little or no education or experience at addressing most, if not all, of the topics I have just set out. Whatever wisdom has been accumulated by the two risking the building of the partnership most often has come from having committed earlier blunders blindly and perhaps learning something from them or not. The rest have been gained through the tutelage of others who themselves may not really have known how to make and sustain a, a, a nourishing marriage or by trying to learn by observing the behavior of others either in real life, in the media, in motion pictures, in novels, by reading self-help books, or from the vast variety of opinions, teaching, and pseudoscience easily available on social media. For the largest number of us then, a sufficiency of good role models or wise teaching has not been available to us before we make our beginning attempts to create a partnership, and we arrive at our marriages in a state of being deluded thinking we know what is to come and how to do the work necessary, when in reality we are lost in stupidity. Now I shall return to another thread I started to observe above. In addition to a growing unwillingness to enter into marriage on the part of those who compose our culture, as well as inadequate or destructive ideas about what a marriage might be, there's yet a further reason that the institution is in trouble. Most who married have failed to work out, as I sketched above, that which should be the preparation for a wedding. Instead, they hold a ceremony that is really a party without real substance. For much of, if not most of the matters the pair will have to address have still not been well addressed and are needing, to, needing a successful resolution at the time of the wedding ceremony. Some are still waiting to be discovered in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. My life experiences and my work have convinced me that a wedding ceremony only has the proper provenance if the two who are being honored have met and have survived the collapse of infatuation, have gone on to discover and to build a love based on embracing the realness of the other, have created adjustments, compromises, and understandings for a huge number of misalignments between them, have kindness for the limitation of their partner, have together already dealt effectively with the other humans who are part of their clan, are fully functioning as individuals in their own right, needing nothing from the other to complete them, but wanting to be with the other because life is much more glorious then, and are able to speak about anything and everything with their partner. Marriage should be a celebration of the hard, intense, and glorious work two people have successfully already done with each other. They're having arrived at supportive ways to be together and their desire to participate in a ritual that is a public recognition of what is a special human triumph they are not just preparing to begin to explore, but is already an outcome they have achieved through many hours of intense dialogue, discovery, and the finding of solutions for so many matters that have seemed in trouble and insoluble. It is a tragedy that many continue to marry because they are supposed to. It is tragedy that many continue to marry while being clueless about what they are attempting to create and how the challenges might be mastered. It is a tragedy that many marry falsely, believing that an array of painful difficulties that still exist will eventually magically disappear because they are hoping that there is either a potential for something better or that what is agonizing before the wedding will somehow go away once the marriage has been held. I shall close these musing by asserting for many, maybe most of my fellow humans in our culture, marriage is not a necessary destination upon reaching the era of maturity. It is a challenge. It is an acquired test, taste. And for anyone interested in its possibilities, I want to note that the hard work does not end when the partnership has been reasonably well-crafted. As does any garden, 
a marriage requires ongoing maintenance and periodic heavy lifting and challenging effort, pruning, watering, fertilizing, <coughs> tilling the soil, replanting, adding new elements, and removing those that are becoming shabby. Recognizing this, I once said to my own Hermine, being with you is my second full-time career. For me, though, it is more than worth the effort. The complexities of both of my careers, being a psychologist and being a married man, feel like marvelous challenges and intense cauldrons in which growth and change are ongoing. And I can continue to find and to refine wisdom if I keep showing up and embracing the difficult complexities of being alive and of being intensely present to my companionship and to my companions in both. That's the end of my introductory chapter. Right on time. You can unmute now. I can understand why you're writing this book. Out of all the things that you've done in your life, your marriage is your greatest accomplishment. I no, I, I have one beyond that, but I, I still have some years left, I hope. My last desire is to let go all my dreams of mattering and of being significant and leaving some trace in the world and to die invisibly. And on my tombstone, it should say, here lies the most, most ordinary person who ever lived. <laughs> I want to learn it to naturally. <laughs> I want to learn to revel in my ordinariness, but I'm not quite finished yet. I want to write a significant book about marriage, for the reasons you mentioned. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, well, those, each one of those chapters could be a book in and of itself. I know. Have your, have your work cut out for you. <laughs> I certainly do. Oh, and there there are several separate things. I I. Don't know if I will include as a postscript a, uh, a, a chapter on creating a step family. That, that could be a whole separate chapter in and of itself. Yeah. And wait, there was one more time. I forgot what the second topic was. Mm -hmm. These are aberrant forms of. It could um, be uh, another book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Don't, don't get me started. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. You've noticed one of my problems. My mind never stops. So as I start working on something, I think of seven other things that maybe should be attached to the one thing I'm working on. I can't let go. Mm -hmm. so good. Maybe you will be my cautionary person <laughs> there and keep me from trying to write a book on everything you've ever wanted to know about everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for listening. Have yeah. a very nice weekend and you too i'm about to take a, a walk with my life okay nice enjoy <laughs> all right bye bye, bye.